Hello friends, how are you? My name is Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about the Norse afterlife. One of my patrons, uh, Mr. Peyton, was asking me if to enter Valhalla people really had to be warriors and if so, where did ordinary people went after death in the old Norse religious perspective? So I decided to give the basics first concerning the Norse afterlife. So you might better understand future videos concerning Norse afterlife places. If you have the basic understandings, it will be easier to understand uh, when I start to develop and go a little deeper into the afterlife panorama of Norse mythology. I would like to quickly, greatly summarize the Norse afterlife panorama so you might have a certain impression of the religious perceptions of pre-Christian Scandinavian peoples concerning the spiritual reality and the places to where the dead went. In the future I shall make more videos about each afterlife place and other concepts related to the Norse afterlife. But in the meantime certain basic notions will suffice, I think. Let's get started. The afterlife has always been a subject of many studies and creates a lot of doubts. Mankind seeks to know and understand what's behind the veiled curtain between this world and the next. We have been seeking it since our existence and the development of our minds in the capacity to express feelings towards loss. It's the ultimate fight against the greatest fear we have, the fear of death. On this video, in short, I will talk about the afterlife as it was seen in Northern European traditional paganism the realms of the gods and the dead and the purpose of each place. Archaeologically speaking, during the Viking Age there were more than 50 different ways of burial and funeral rites. This is because the afterlife panorama for pre-Christian Scandinavians was a multitude of realities different choices depending on your social status and the caste you belong to, as in social class. After death it was believed by the pre-Christian Scandinavians that they would go to the realm of their gods, to a place where they would continue to do practically the same things they did in life their crafts, hunting, fishing, farming, serving and so on. As such, they would need in the afterlife all the tools of their trade and all sorts of objects people used in their mundane life in the medieval society of Scandinavia. Such objects would be taken with them to their graves all the material culture that defined who a person was in society would be buried with that person. For instance, a person would be buried with a comb, a comb with fish motifs, not only an object of personal hygiene to be used in the afterlife, but also marking the person as someone linked to the fishing economy and by the craftsmanship of the object it would be someone important and wealthy to possess such an object. So it also marked the social status of a person, probably not a fisherman but a person linked to the fishing industry or the fishing economy, probably owning a couple of boats and crews. Generally, man took their weapons and other tools of their trade, if they were craftsmen of any sort or blacksmiths, they would take the tools of their work and even the molds to make all sorts of amulets 
uh, probably molds to make Mjolnir's Thor's hammer, which in itself, the mold becomes the evidential factor of the person's trade and it has religious connotations due to the religious symbols in it. Farmers would take utensils of agriculture and in some cases dead farm animals would also go with them. Women were buried with domestic equipment, their jewelry if they were part of an important social class. It's common to think these pre-Christian Scandinavian burials were all made in Viking ships or Viking boats, or the boat motif was always present. There are many such burials, of course, but not all would be linked to the boat. But speaking of the boat motif, for people of great renown, either kings, some jarls, and rarely women with some connection to the religious life were buried in boats, covered by the earth, forming a great mound. Or we have cases of people buried in specific places surrounded by a ring of stones laid out to make the shape of a boat. The boat motif might have been an earlier perception of the afterlife, of a spiritual place only reachable by boat, crossing a body of water to reach the underworld, which was a deem fairly common in many ancient societies. But the boat motif might also have been linked to some early cult of Freya, or perhaps a cult involving the gods that would later be labelled Vanir. The stone ships might be the representation of Freya's hull, Sisrumnir, which is one of the names appearing in a list of mythical boats in the Norse mythology. I have made a video about this, uh, which you can watch in more detail about the ship motif linked to a possible Vanir cult, possibly to Freya, a death goddess. I'll leave the link down below in the description. Now, speaking of Freya, aside from Valhalla itself, one of the most famous places in the Norse afterlife is, of course, Folkvanga. But who exactly goes to these two places? It's true that the warriors are divided between Odin and Freya. Half go to Valhalla, in the region of Gladsheimr, which doesn't necessarily have to be in Osgard, but we shall get to that later. And the other half of the slain in battle goes to Sisrumnir, the hull of Freya, in the region of Folkvangr. In the sources, it's quite specific that only warriors slain in battle go to these two places. Nothing is said about warriors that never died in battle. People that have been warriors uh, their entire lives, but their cause of death was something else other than being killed in the battlefield. Only those slain in battle go to Valhalla and or Sisrumnir. Although it seems that Sisrumnir is for a certain group of people, probably warriors of great renown or nobles linked to the cult of Freya. There were a couple of cults related to Freya, but both, both genders being part of such cults, and most of the priesthood were women and from nobility. So Freya's hall itself might have been reserved for people with high social status and linked to Freya, while Folkvangre, a broader reality in which Freya's halls stand, might have been the place for the half of the warriors slain in battle, while only the bravest of the brave go to Valhalla or Valhall. As I've said, Valhalla stands in Gladsheimer, 
which according to Snorri's Gilfaginning, it's a region in Hosgard itself. Although in other sources, nothing is specifically said that Valhalla is indeed in Osgard, and this seems to have been a shift of places created by Snorre Sturluson himself, placing an afterlife for noble warriors closer to Odin, who became a god more similar to the Christian god during the Icelandic Middle Ages, precisely during Snorre's time. Shifting Valhalla to a more divine realm seems to be Catholic influences. For all we know, Valhalla seems to have been originally in Hell, the realm of the dead. Because according to the poems in the poetic Hedda, absolutely everyone goes to Hell. It doesn't matter from which so social class people belong to, everyone, without question, must go to Hell first. And once there, people are sorted out to their rightful places. Please watch my video about hell and who goes there. Once again, I'll leave the link to that one too down below in the description. Also, I think it's never enough to reinforce this. A lot of people mistakenly say Hellheimer. This was never the name of the underworld in Norse mythology. That is a Marvel invention, as simple as that. Some people argue that there is no harm in calling it Helheimr, since it's a world or a region like the others. But it is not true. The reason why Hell is not Helheimr is because it's not a specific place like the realm of the giants, Jotunheimr, or the realm of the dwarves and dark elves, Svartalfheimr. Hell is the entire underworld. It's not a region or a place among other places, but the entire afterlife. Osgard is not Osgard Heimer because it's the divine realm. Hell is its opposite, a divine realm as well, but the entire afterlife to where even gods go after death. You will better understand this perception as soon as you watch the previous video I've mentioned, entitled uh, Going Down to Hell. There is one particular home of the gods named Valoskjalf. Most likely throughout the internet, especially if you go into Wikipedia, you will certainly find that this place is the seat of Odin, or the whole home throne of Odin. In fact, only Snorri Sturluson mentions that Valaskjalf belongs to Odin. However, he doesn't say it's Odin's throne, because Odin's throne is called Hlitskjalf. Valaskjalf, on the other hand, might be related to the god Vali, or most likely to the god Thyr. Thyr was the lord the true uh, shifting of the gods before being replaced by Odin. The myths of the gods were highly tempered with by Christian skulls, and in the case of the god Fear, the Christians made an absolute mess of the myths. If Valoskjalf is indeed the hull of Fear, then we can say with a certain degree of confidence that this was the hull to where kings, jarls and heresies lords went after death. The largest home, house, hole in the north afterlife is Bilskirnir, the, in the region of Thrundvang, the home of Thur and Sith. The region is named after Thur's daughter, Thrud, meaning power. You might also find the name Thrudheimr, which is the name given in Grimnismal to the residence of the god Thur. However, Thur's residence is called Thrudvangr. In Gilfaginning, uh, Skaldskaparmol, and the Inglinga saga. Nevertheless, it's here that uh, uh, 
Bilskirni lies, the hull of Thur. You might find again in Wikipedia that Bilskirnir is in Valhalla itself, which is wrong. Anyway, it's to this place that those of the farmer class and the Thralar, Thralls, go to after death. As I've said before, Thralls are regarded as slaves, but they were in fact paid workers. But they did not own land. They did not have land or property, and as such they did not cast a vote in the assembly. The old thing, or just the thing. Don't get me wrong, slavery existed in the Viking Age society, and even people who were once common members of the society could become slaves to pay a debt or as a punishment dictated by the thing for some crime they committed. Hunters go to Huldr's place in Hidalar or Hidalir. Huldr is a sun god and a god of the daytime hunt. I suspect that he may have been a more important god in Scandinavia than given credit for. Before the cult of Odin was introduced, it might have been him along with Skadi, the divine pair of Scandinavia. Huldr being the sun god and god of the daytime hunt, while Skadi was the moon goddess and goddess of evening time hunt, as well as goddess of winter and the winter hunt. Speaking of Skade, or Skadi, the other half of the hunters go to her palace, Thrymheimr. According to Gilfaginning, Sofabekr is the residence of the goddess Saga. It has been suggested that the name Saga is related to the Old Norse word Sjö, to see, but it might also have a link to Saga and Seja, say or tell. There has been some discussion around this goddess and this afterlife reality as to be the place to where the Volvur go, the Cirruses and Prophetesses, as it might be implied the practice of the art of divination, future seeing. Now, one quick note concerning this afterlife place. Sokvebekra means sunken bank, a body of water overflowing into land. The hull of the goddess Frigg is called Fensalir, marsh hulls, so a hull in a place that also often floods and is always wet, a marsh. But both places have a similar meaning. Also, Frigg in some accounts has been called a Cirrus, and she is a goddess related to divination, prophecy, foresight, etc. So, there might be a certain relation with these two places and the fact that both stand on flooded lands. As I've said, it's quite possible that Volur or Volvur would go into these places after death and also people sacrificed in bogs, swamps, marshes, sacrificing by drowning or simply offering the human sacrifice post-mortem and placing it in a body of water. Speaking of water, merchants and fishermen go to Nothon, the hulls of the god Njordr. However, those who were drowned at the sea would go to Ron's Hall, which has many names, some of which uh, Ronar Land, uh, Ronar Salr, Ron Vegre, Ron Bedre. <laughs> Ron is the personification of the sea, so people uh, literally went to the bottom of the sea. And who's to say that human sacrifices weren't also thrown into the sea? We find human sacrifices in bodies of water, such as bogs, because it has easy access to us, it's inland, and the remains don't move around. While if human sacrifices were thrown into the sea, we might never know obviously because they are carried by the waves and eaten by the fish. But we can't discard this possibility. What is important to take in mind is that the gods only accept the best of each social class, 
because each place has limits, according to the sources, of course. For instance, Valhalla has 540 doors that 800 men can exit from at once, supposedly where the Heneriar live. Tours Hall, Bilskirnir, has 540 rooms, so there are clear limitations in the home of the gods and the places of the afterlife. It tends to get crowded. Therefore, each person must strive to do the very best in their lives to be accepted by the gods in their rightful places, according to their social status and social class. Which is why most people end up in hell. Please do watch my video Going Down to Hell and you will better understand that absolutely everyone goes there and once in there, they are sent to their rightful places. Those who have been chosen by the gods, of course. The very best of the best. And please, if you have the time, uh, watch my video about Nostrond, which is another afterlife place intimately tied with hell. But we shall get to that. Hell is not a terrible place of suffering and darkness to where people go to suffer for their sins and misdeeds. That sort of picture was later on added by Snorri Sturluson, trying to make a parallel with the infernal realm of the Christian mythology, later on named Hell precisely because of the Norse Hell and Snorri's terrible, frightening description. Hell, in other sources, mainly the, in Old Norse poetry, as I have stated in previous videos, is a very pleasant place of eternal summer and a great abundance of food, much like the Roman Elysium. Hell was the entire afterlife, the underworld itself, the very earth beneath our feet. As the religious panorama changed and progressively evolved from a prehistoric perception of a spiritual realm beneath the earth, into a more complex reality that fits into the hierarchical societies of the Iron Age and Viking Age, the entire geographical reality of Hell also changed. In Hell, in some versions we have outside it or in it, but somehow divided by natural geographical features like a mountain chain or some river, we have the place called Niflhelm. It's a dark realm to where supposedly criminals, oath breakers, traitors, rapists and so on go to suffer. In this Niflhelm you have the hole called Nostrond, the hole of snakes. Nostrond literally means the shore or coast of corpses. I have a theory on this place that, and its purpose and I would very much like you to watch my 45 minute long video about it. I'll leave the link down below in the description. But suffice to say, Nostron has a certain image of terrible suffering and anguish, which might indeed have been a misinterpretation created by Christians who failed to understand a deeper understanding of prehistoric afterlife perceptions. Also, to Nostrand later on it was added that people who committed suicide would also go there to suffer. This is without a doubt a Near Eastern monotheistic perception, as in such religions, uh, such religious beliefs, suicide was highly condemned because one cannot take one's life. Only God can do that. But this was a, a religious rule, so to speak, implemented to avoid lords, nobles and other members of the society with high social status from losing servants and slaves. If you could not kill yourself, you had to endure your life of servitude, and so your master would not lose money and property with your loss. Suicide in pagan cultures was quite normal. People who committed suicide going to Nostrond, a pagan old Norse afterlife place, 
doesn't make sense. Because in pre-Christian Scandinavia, indeed, suicide was quite common. As we can see in some old local place names referring to people who, who took their own lives in that specific place. For instance, old age in Old Norse society was a problem and many men took their own lives before being old. Being old meant being fragile, being an easy target, losing one's independence, loneliness, etc. Unfortunately, nothing has changed and remains exactly the same nowadays for many old people. Being old in a medieval society was very, very difficult and suicide was quite common, as it is today, unfortunately. In a pagan perception, an afterlife place of eternal suffering for those who committed suicide makes no sense whatsoever as suicide was seen as an act of bravery and an escape from a fate that might take one's dignity. Suicide in pagan societies was an honorable act. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, up real.